Well, hopefully you've had a really great breakfast. There's nothing like a great breakfast to start the day. Uh, and I, I think it'll be really great to say uh, thank you to John and his team who've been cooking that breakfast for us. So thank you very much, John. Uh, yeah, that was it. Was a uh, fact. Right now, we're going to uh, 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 go into the uh, the talk uh, by Dr. Richard Beer. Um, uh, God, black holes in the big bang. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Richard Beer, as you just heard, uh, and I want to talk to you this morning about God, black holes, and the big bang. In actual fact, this is really an excuse to talk about my favourite subject, astronomy, and to show you some stunning images. The reason for putting the lights out is that um, you'll actually see these images much better uh, if, we, if it is the darkness. I think probably best with all the lights out, John, if that's all right. Is that okay? Oh, they don't need to see me. No, they <laughs> okay. So I wonder if you've ever looked up at the night sky and asked yourself questions like, where does the universe come from? Why is it here? Why are we here? What I'll be sharing with you this morning are my own personal answers to these questions. I wonder if you spotted the well-known constellation of Orion in this image. Um, and its bright red star, supergiant star Betelgeuse, and also Sirius, uh, the brightest star in the sky. So there's Betelgeuse and there's Sirius. Let's start with the most distant object you can see from the dark side with the naked eye, the Andromeda galaxy. With a pair of binoculars, you'll see it as a dark, dim, fuzzy patch. But to get an image as good as this, you'll need something like the Hubble Space Telescope. Andromeda is part of our local group of galaxies and slightly larger than our own Milky Way. Every bright point of light is a star and there's something like 100,000 million of them. That's one followed by 11 zeros. Although Andromeda is one of the nearest galaxies to us, it is still two and a half million light years away, meaning that the light we see from it has been travelling for two and a half million years to reach us. It left long before modern humans appeared on the Earth. So when we look at Andromeda, we're looking back in time. We can only ever see Andromeda as it was two and a half million years ago. Our own sun, of course, is a star. And this is a view of it just setting at Sheridan. In a galaxy like Andromeda, or the Milky Way, some stars are much bigger than our sun, like Betelgeuse, and some are smaller and fainter. Here's another beautiful spiral galaxy. These are probably Hubble telescope pictures. Of them. And another one. And galaxies come in all shapes and sizes. And this is an image I took of the galaxy M61 using the Fox telescope in Hawaii. Sadly, I didn't have to go to Hawaii to take it, uh, which was a big shame, um, because I used the Fox telescope uh, there, and there's one in Australia as well, which were built to be operated over the internet by school students in the UK. So it was actually at Warwick University when I took this. Galaxies sometimes come close enough to collide, like these two here. But individual stars never collide because they're so far apart from one another, whatever it might look like in galaxy images. Astronomers think that if we could see our own Milky Way from outside, it would look very similar to this galaxy, the Southern Pinwheel. Our Sun is just one star among 100,000 million in the Milky Way galaxy. Light takes 100,000 years to travel across the galaxy at the speed of light, which is a mind-blowing 300,000 
kilometers every second, if you can imagine that. Which certainly makes the voyages of Starship Enterprise in Star Trek pure fiction. It also means that the Milky Way is unimaginably big by any human standards. If this were the Milky Way, we would be about a third of the way up from the center in one of the bright spiral arms. The small pink areas in the spiral arms, which you might just be able to see, are glowing clouds of hydrogen gas. They indicate where new stars are forming. Now, maybe you can't quite make them out. The very bright points of light are massive, very hot, bright, newly formed stars. And the Milky Way is actually shaped like a thin disk, like a sort of frisbee shape. So this is what it would look like if you could see it from beyond the spiral arms. A very thin disk of bright stars and dark dust. And as we're inside this disk, what we actually see in the night sky is a band of light uh, stars stretching across the sky. We call this the Milky Way. And we're very fortunate here in North Norfolk that we can still see it on a dark night, as there is this relatively little light pollution. Wednesday last week was very clear, and I was actually able to see the Milky Way very easily from Northrench, just a few miles away. Through binoculars, Andromeda was easily seen as a fuzzy patch, and could just about be glimpsed with the naked eye on looking slightly to one side, so as to use the sensitive outer part of the retina. This beautiful image taken from the Canary Islands by amateur astrophotographers shows that the constellation of Orion is close to the Milky Way. You can see the three stars of Orion's belt and his sword um, in this picture. So there's the belt and there's the sword. And, and that's Beta Juice up there. It's a bright yellow star above and um, it is a supergiant star. The patches of red are where new stars are forming. One of these in the sword of Orion is called the Orion Nebula. Through binoculars, it appears as a fuzzy patch of light that you won't, but you won't see the red color. Um, this is a close-up of the Orion Nebula where new stars are forming out of hydrogen and dust. You can see some of the hydrogen glowing with a pink color. Galaxies are unbelievably big but clusters of galaxies like this one are even bigger. And on an even bigger scale, clusters of galaxies themselves cluster, forming a sort of three-dimensional cosmic spider's web. All in all, there are estimated to be 100,000 million galaxies in the universe. So if the average number of stars in each is also 100,000 million, that makes a total in the universe of 10,000 million, million, million stars in all, one followed by 22 zeros. All this bigness exceeds my imagination and makes me realize that if God created the universe, he must be unbelievably greater and more powerful than anything I can possibly imagine. This is one of the most famous images ever obtained by the Hubble Space Telescope. In 2003 to 4, it was pointing for days at a small portion of sky, which looked to be empty of bright stars and galaxies. And this is what it saw. 10,000 very faint galaxies stretching back in time, almost to the Big Bang when the universe began 14 billion years ago, nearly. So if you look here, you, you can see fainter and fainter um, spots of light, and the very faintest ones um, are almost uh, 14 billion light years away. The faintest stars you see here are the, some of the very first galaxies ever to exist. They're so far away that light from them has traveled for most of the history of the universe to reach us. So we are truly looking back in time when the universe was very young. Astronomers now know 
that the universe began as a tiny point of unbelievably hot, dense matter nearly 14 billion years ago. Since this moment that we call the Big Bang, the universe has been expanding outwards, getting bigger and bigger and more and more spread out. Scientifically speaking, the Big Bang was when matter, space and time were all created. The correspondence with the Christian belief that God created matter, space and time when he created the universe is striking. It's important to realise that God is not part of the universe, as Richard Dawkins assumes when he presents a so-called scientific argument as to why God cannot exist. Christians also believe that God is not just outside of space, but outside of time as well. People often ask, what came before the Big Bang? But scientifically, this question is meaningless, because time began at the Big Bang, and there cannot be any before when there's no time. However, we can ask philosophical and theological questions like, why did the Big Bang occur? or who caused it, or what caused it. These are not scientific questions, because science is about understanding the universe and its laws. And until there is a universe, there are no scientific laws, and therefore no science. My personal belief is that the universe exists because God wanted to create it. To me, the creation accounts in Genesis are not literal scientific accounts of actual days of creating by God. Instead, they convey key theological messages that God created the universe and that what he created was good. And this includes the earth, all its plants and animals, and above all, human beings, who were created specifically to be able to have a loving relationship with God. For me, the Big Bang, evolution, and the 14 billion years since are how God created the universe that we know today. In a nutshell, science explains how and theology explains why. An expanding universe was predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity, published in 1916. But Einstein didn't like the idea and modified his equations to eliminate this prediction. However, when Hubble's observations showed in the 1920s that the universe was actually expanding, Einstein re uh, retracted his modification, saying it was the greatest blunder of his whole life. Despite this, Einstein's genius is extraordinary that predictions of relativity are totally counterintuitive and stretch the imagination to the limit, but they've now been confirmed many times over. Today, scientists are used to the idea that space and time are inextricably linked and form a four-dimensional space-time, where time and distance can be different for different people. And we've all heard of the equation E equals mc squared, telling us that mass can be converted to energy and vice versa. That's another prediction of relativity. Relativity also says that what we think of as gravity is actually the bending of space near to massive objects like stars. This was quickly confirmed in 1919 by an expedition to the island of Principe of West Africa to observe the total solar eclipse. During the eclipse, stars close to the edge of the sun were seen to have shifted by exactly the amount that Einstein predicted due to the bending of space. The predictions of relativity are so weird that we struggle to comprehend them and only complicated maths can properly describe what's going on. This is a page from one of Einstein's notebooks. 
Another totally bizarre theory of modern physics is quantum theory, but we all prove it's correct every day, simply by switching on anything that contains electronics. Without quantum theory, none of the things in this picture would work. It seems to me that there are two ways of looking at mind-bending theories like relativity and quantum theory. On the one hand, we could marvel at how clever we human beings are to be able to have discovered such complex theories. On the other hand, we could take the humbler view and say that our difficulties in understanding the universe point to a mind far greater than ours, the mind of a creator god whose understanding is infinitely more than ours. This is the view that makes most sense to me. Here's another well-known scientific genius, Sir Isaac Newton. Most of us are familiar with the idea that it's gravity that keeps the moon in its orbit around the Earth and the planets in orbit around the Sun. But cast your mind back to the late 17th century. Who but a genius would have thought that the movement of the moon in the sky was in any way connected to an apple falling from a tree in Lincolnshire? if we're to take that story at face value. Newton's laws of motion and his law of gravitation completely explain why the orbits of the planets are ellipses, how long they take to go around the sun, and how far they travel. And Newton's laws are still all we need to describe the motions of tennis balls, skateboarders, skateboards, rockets, and the International Space Station. For hundreds of years, Newton's laws have epitomized the extraordinary success of modern science. But this success was only possible because of Christian belief in God. Historians are agreed that science only developed in Europe from the Middle Ages onwards because people believed in a rational God who created an ordered universe subject to fixed laws that could be discovered by science. Newton's laws even explain the orbits of comets like Leo and Kael Bopp that many of us would have seen in 1998. Without modern science and a belief in a rational, loving God, mankind was ruled by superstitious beliefs. For example, that comets were warnings from the gods or portents of doom. The Bayer Tapestry illustrates this beautifully, with the English pointing in terror at Halley's Comet that appeared immediately prior to the Battle of Hastings. And you can see them there. Or how about this frieze from about 800 BC, showing Babylonian gods fighting and killing each other. Without belief in a rational, loving god, one was always at the mercy of the gods. Better not to make too much noise or annoy them in some other way. Otherwise, something dreadful might happen. Back to some astronomy. I just wanted to show some beautiful pictures. <laughs> That's the excuse for this, really. Um, and when stars, small stars run out of fuel, their outer layers drift off into space producing beautiful patterns like these. The star centers collapse and become white dwarf stars about the size of the Earth, intensely hot and so dense that a single cubic centimeter would weigh several tons. And when large stars run out of fuel, they explode as supernovae. Their centers then collapse in a fraction of a second to become either neutron stars or black holes. This is, shows a picture of the remnant of a supernova seen by the Chinese in 1054. At its center is a neutron star, just made of neutrons, and so dense that a cubic centimeter would weigh a million tons. The centers of the biggest stars collapse to form something even more amazing, a black hole. This is so dense that even light 
can't escape its gravity. And that's why it's called the black hole, of course. And black holes were actually predicted by Einstein's theory of relativity long before they were detected. And amazingly, and scarily for some people, uh, galaxies, including our Milky Way, have supermassive black holes at their centers, which would be billions of times more massive than the sun. This is the first ever image of a black hole obtained by the Event Horizon Telescope just three years ago in 2019. More exactly, it's actually a radio telescope image of the shadow of a supermassive black hole at the center of a nearby galaxy. I'd now like to show you a simulation of what happens when you get two smallish black holes orbiting around each other. They spiral in closer and closer and eventually merge. As they orbit each other, they lose energy by emitting gravitational waves, a traveling vibrations in space-time. Although predicted by relativity over 100 years ago, these were only first detected in 2015. So you see the uh, two black holes orbiting as they get lose energy, they get closer and closer together, speed up, and then you get a sudden burst of gravitational waves uh, as they merge. And then the gravitational waves travel through space uh, and eventually reach the Earth. And detecting uh, gravitational waves is an absolutely amazing feat because the movement of space that needs detecting is no more than one ten millionth of the size of an atom. Uh, and here's uh, how you do it using a detector uh, four kilometers in size. And the graphs you can see here are the first gravitational wave signals ever detected, coming from two black holes which collided over a billion years ago. And the signals were detected by these two four kilometer sized detectors in America. They turned out to be exactly what relativity predicts, providing one more amazing confirmation of Einstein's theory. And just for the record, the gravitational waves emitted in the fifth of a second that the black holes were merging carried 10 times more power in that brief time than the total power output of all the 10,000 million, million, million stars in the whole universe, which was just amazing. Now when converted to sound waves, this is what the black hole merger sounds like. It's called a chirp for obvious reasons. So what you're actually listening to here is two black holes merging uh, over a billion years ago. So you can go home and tell people that's what you heard <laughs> during the session this morning. Scientific research is a bit like doing a jigsaw puzzle with many people around the world putting in different pieces. It's almost never the result of one person working alone and doing a single, cru a, a sim single crucial experiment or making one definitive observation. And at first, scientists only have a few clues about a new phenomenon. Then as new discoveries are made by people around the world, a picture begins to build up. Ideas start linking together but there are still many puzzles remaining. Eventually, all the evidence connects up and provides a good understanding of the phenomenon being researched. And the new understanding fits into existing wider scientific understanding, so it all fits together. 
There's so many things about the universe that are exactly right for us to exist. Most obviously, we're just the right distance from the sun for liquid water to exist. And water is essential for all life, of course. Any closer to the sun, and water would evaporate away. Any further, and it would freeze solid. Our Earth is a beautiful place, full of variety and with an incredible diversity of living things. We can all too easily take it for granted. Here, by comparison, is the surface of Mars. What a sensation it would cause if astronomers discovered just one beautiful living thing, say a flower, growing out of the surface of another planet. Or compare the surface of the Moon, or Venus. Anyone landing on Venus would be crushed, cooked, corroded, suffocated, and blown over. No wonder NASA had such problems for years trying to land a working space probe on Venus. The Earth is beautiful and full of abundant life and bears no comparison with anywhere else we know about in the solar system. To me, this speaks of the exuberant creativity and loving care of God who created the Earth for us to inhabit. And here's something else which is just right for us to exist. It's fortunate that the Moon and Jupiter are where they are, because they shield the Earth from asteroids orbiting the Sun, which might otherwise occasionally hit the Earth. Without the Moon and Jupiter, life on Earth would have been wiped out long before it could really get started. Now we've all heard about the comet that hit Mexico 65 million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs. This image shows what happened 50,000 years ago when a much smaller object, about the size of Chroma Church, hit Arizona at 25,000 miles an hour. And you can see that crater's um, over a kilometre across. Here's another thing about the universe that just happens to be right. For stars and galaxies to form, the force of gravity needs to be just right, too strong, and the universe would have collapsed in on itself before any stars and galaxies could have formed, too weak, and gravity wouldn't have been strong enough to form the stars and galaxies. There are many other subtle aspects of the universe that seem to be just right for us to exist, but I'll just mention one. In the 1950s, astronomer Fred Hoyle, and that's in there, was working with a physicist on understanding how the element carbon got formed inside stars. Together, they discovered that the energy levels uh, inside certain atoms were precisely what they needed to be for carbon to form. Had these energy levels been even slightly different, carbon would never have formed, and life would not exist. Hoyle declared that nothing had shaken his atheism as much as this one discovery. Scientists call the apparent fine-tuning of the universe the anthropic principle, the idea that the universe seems designed for us to exist. For some, the only explanation of the anthropic principle is that there must be billions of parallel universes, all with different values of nature's fundamental constants, like the strength of gravity. Then, clearly, we must live in the one universe where life is possible, and so the puzzle disappears. But an obvious problem with this line of reasoning is that it is pure speculation, and not science at all, because science deals with what can actually be observed, and any parallel universes would not be observable. But apart from this, a more serious objection is that it just seems a totally contrived way of avoiding the conclusion that an intelligent God um, created the universe. And he did it in such a way that life could exist. 
I know which of these two explanations makes the most logical sense to me out of parallel universes and God. Some Christians are bothered by Charles Darwin's discovery that life on Earth seems to have developed over millions of years by a process of evolution and natural selection. They think it contradicts the Genesis account of animals and plants being created by God within the space of a few days. But as I have already suggested, Genesis was not written as a scientific account, but as a, but as a statement of important theological ideas and it uses language that a pre-scientific culture could understand. To me, it is a source of wonder that God created such an amazing earth in such an incredible universe and took billions of years to do so and that he chose evolution as his method of creating plants and animals. I find Charles Kingsley's pronouncement in 1881 really helpful. We knew of old that God was so wise that he could make all things. But behold, he is so much wiser even than that, that he can make all things make themselves. Of course, we now understand the process of evolution in terms of DNA. It's surely a source of wonder that the instructions for making every single living thing can be obtained by arranging in different orders just four letters, A, C, G, and T, representing just four chemicals. The simplicity and genius of this points to a rational creator God whose mind is beyond our understanding. I don't believe that the universe is simply the result of indifferent blind chance, as atheists such as Richard Dawkins would have us believe. Nor was it created by God with all its scientific laws in place 14 billion years ago and then left to run on its own. Just as a watchmaker might make a watch, wind it up and leave it to run. Instead, Christians believe that God actively sustains the universe moment by moment, perhaps a little like the way that a mains cable into your TV set keeps much of the day playing. My experience, and that of countless other Christians, is that God is active in the world, answers prayers, and occasionally intervenes to give us what we call miracles. But, you may say, do we really need God to make sense of the world? Won't science one day find a theory of everything that explains all that there is to be known about the universe? The late Stephen Hawking was one of those who believed that this was the case. Some scientists point out that modern physics has discovered that what we call a vacuum is not nothing after all, but a seeding mass of virtual particles coming in and out of existence. <coughs> then, they argue, the universe could have arisen by chance out of these quantum fluctuations. However, even if this were so, and even if science did discover a theory of everything, the question still remains, where did that come from? The universe cannot have created itself. That is a logical impossibility. The only logically acceptable answer to why the universe exists must lie outside the universe itself, and therefore outside of science. For me, all the evidence points to a loving and rational creator God who is far beyond my human understanding, who brought into being this wonderful universe as a place for human beings to exist, with whom he could have a two-way relationship of love. As you can see, being a scientist and an astronomer strengthens my belief in a loving God, the loving God I read about in the Bible. I wonder what your view is on how science relates to faith. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I will try and answer any questions you have, but don't guarantee to have all the answers. Feel free to ask anything uh, about faith or about uh, astronomy.
astronomy. Uh, and just finally, um, I brought along a selection of helpful books, uh, which you may like to look at there, over there on the side. I would particularly recommend um, David Wilkinson's book, God, Time and Stephen Hawking, which is this one, um, which is a very readable and easy to understand account of the sort of ideas I've been sharing this morning. And for those who would like to delve deeper, I printed out a list of science and faith books, uh, which you can pick up if you, if you like, that's on the table as well. Um, incidentally, this talk has been recorded and should be available on the Chroma Church YouTube channel. Uh, and I'll also make available an illustrated transcript if you feel you'd like to um, think about some of these ideas a bit more. So thank you very much. Right, now is the time for all your burning questions, uh, as ever complex or simple as you'd like. Preferably uh, simple. Preferably simple, which is there. So, um, go for it. One more question there. One word, three letters. Why? Why, why what? Why? Any of it, why? Why do you do it? It's a hobby, isn't it? I mean, why, are we, why, why are we doing this? You might well ask why any study you know, why do we have people in universities researching anything from ancient um, history uh, to, um, to science? Some things um, are obviously practical, like engineering that I've been studied. Uh, there's a good reason for studying that in practical terms. But um, one answer to your question of why study astronomy is that it actually, human beings are curious uh, beings and uh, we've been created, I believe, by God to be curious and we want to uh, understand more and more of the universe that we live in. That's just human nature to understand more and more. And also, um, the early scientists um, for the Mid Ages, or many of them Christians, have believed that they were doing this um, as an act of worship. They were actually discovering more about God by um, uh, studying the universe and there is a statement in Romans I think it is that says um, uh, what had, could be known about God is clear to everyone uh, from looking at what he's created so I hope one of the conclusions of this morning is that um, we can actually learn a lot about uh, God um, his infinite uh, size, power intelligence, the fact that he's created something uh, exceptional and, and loving um, his exuberant creativity as well. We can learn about God by studying uh, astronomy. And I think it was um, uh, Francis Bacon who said that um, God wrote two books. Uh, one is the book of his words, which is the Bible, but he also wrote the book of his works. So God's two books are words and works, and they mutually complement each other. Um, Excellent. Thank you. I think we had another question over there. Yeah, go for it. Tim. <coughs> yes, um, I find it very difficult, difficult to get my mind around the idea that we can see uh, something which began a galaxy which is very early, near the time, 14, nearly 14 billion years ago. And presumably it's taken light from that galaxy to travel to us 14 billion years or thereabouts. But yet 14 billion years ago we were probably at the same place as that galaxy because of the Big Bang. That's where we started from. Does that, does that mean that the universe is expanding at the speed of light? That's a very good question, Tim. And it all gets rather complicated. Um, and uh, one of the OU courses I'm just looking at at the moment is sort of thinks about exactly that sort of thing. In actual fact, um, you're absolutely right that we all started, you know, very close together. Um, but um, light has been travelling for nearly 14 billion years from some of these galaxies. Um, in that time, the universe has been expanding. Um, 
So we are actually seeing them uh, as they were that amount of time ago, and we are now much further from them than we would have been when the light left. Um, okay. Now actually understanding how fast the universe is expanding, the, there's some, the observable universe, the, the universe that we can actually see, um, uh, is only within 46 billion light years. Any further than that, and light hasn't had time to reach us uh, since the Big Bang. So, um, the, the observable universe is, is the limit of everything we can see. But that is expanding, the, the limit of the observable universe is expanding about, at about three times the speed of light. So this means we can actually see less and less of the universe as time goes on, because it's expanding faster than light is travelling, so we can see less and less of it, uh, which is an interesting conundrum. I don't know if that helps him. But it, it's, it's really hard to get your head around it. Um, I, I sort of struggle with this a bit, I must admit. Um, okay, it's probably enough on that. Thanks very much. Uh, oh, I've got a question at the back. Uh, Richard, I think one of your slides had a watch with a cross. Um, Richard Dawkins wrote a book, The Blind Watch Maker, I think. Yes. Uh, how do you square that? Okay. Um, well, that watch is, what he's referring to is Paley's uh, suggestion, I think it was in the 1700s, that you know, we could think of the universe as being something created by God and then left to run. And many people nowadays, uh, many Christians have the idea that that's the way the universe works. Um, you know, God created it, and now it just carries on um, uh, according to the laws he created, and um, God's not involved anymore. But that's not the Christian view. The Christian view is that God is actually actively involved in sustaining the universe in the same way that, you know, the, the mains cable into your TV set uh, keeps strictly going or match of the day or whatever uh, you like watching. Um, so, now Richard Dawkins, as you know, um, is an absolutely fanatical um, opponent of any sort of religion, including Christianity. Um, and his most well-known book would be um, The God Delusion. And many Christians have, and I put these books on the, on the book list and so many, many Christians have sort of written books countering that. One of the best ones is um, uh, The Dawkins Delusion by Alistair McGrath, and couldn't find my copy to bring along, so I must have lent it to somebody. But, um, so Dawkins uh, tries to ridicule religion, and he says it's unscientific, but if you read The God Delusion, which is not a pleasant experience, but if you do read all 400 odd pages of it, it's just full of um, uh, value judgments, unbiased assertions, unscientific statements. He is the ultimate uh, example of what he claims is wrong with religion. In other words, there is no scientific evidence for what the assertions he's making them. But there's plenty of evidence for, Christ for Christianity. We know, those of us who are Christians know that it's an evidence-based faith. We've got the evidence of the, the Bible and the historical uh, accounts of Jesus. Um, but we've also got the evidence of God working in Christians' lives and uh, in miracles, um, and really the way that people experience God changing, uh, changing their lives uh, since they've become Christians. So, um, where am I going with this? Yeah, coming back to the, I don't know that specific book by Dawkins, but what he's alluding to is this idea of Paley's that um, God created the universe like a watchmaker and left it to tick on. And um, he's obviously criticising that. But um, one of the, another thing that should be said about Dawkins is that he hasn't really a, an understanding uh, of what Christianity really believes. We're dealing with big, 
big subjects here. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, uh, what, what we will do there is uh, draw a halt to the questions, but Richard will be uh, available afterwards, so you can come and quiz him personally uh, as well, uh, as, uh, uh, as complex or as simple as you want afterwards. So you don't, you, if you don't have to rush off, that would be, be great. Uh, also, um, if uh, there are any questions um, uh, about faith, uh, etc., you can speak to Richard, um, you can speak to Ben, I remember his name now this time, Ben, uh, or, or myself or, or any of the other helpers. And also, there, there goes a, a, a standard uh, invitation to you all uh, to come uh, to, to church to explore uh, questions of faith uh, uh, um, on, a, on a Sunday morning, basically over in that big building in the centre of town um, at, at um, uh, quarter to nine or, or 10.30 great to see you, actually, where we could continue to have these complex and simple conversations. Well, through Martin. Uh, and St Martin's in, in, in Sheffield Park, absolutely, at 10.30. Um, uh, but what I'd like to do now is uh, uh, finish off to say um, uh, thank you, really, to Richard. He's given us an incredibly uh, interesting and thought-provoking uh, uh, talk there. He's given, he's, he's given what he promised, which was answers, and some answers to some big questions of why the universe exists uh, and why we're here. Uh, and, can you, and you can see God's, uh, God's work in, in creation. So I'd just like you all to join together and, and, and thank uh, Richard uh, in the customary fashion. Thank you. Thank you.